everybody. This is Teresa Cochran with Engage Art. I am the um, contest and the content director, and I'm so excited that you guys are coming to, to spend some time with us today. This is a, a different thing that we're trying. This will be our first interview with one of our masters and mentors in this live format where you can send in your questions and interact with the masters and mentors. So welcome for those of you who are not familiar with Engage Art. Engage Art's job and what we want to do is to help artists both personally and professionally and we want to do that by reintroducing artists to scripture as an inspiration for their work and for their life. Uh, we also want to reintroduce artists to the church for the benefit of the church so that folks that are there can understand scripture better through the um, through the work of artists. So <clears throat> we are gonna be starting some new things this fall and we'll be doing some more of these live formats um, to talk about some of those things soon. So stay on our social media pages and you'll find them. Um, but today I wanna start with a really interesting quote by a great Southern writer. As a matter of fact, she's famously Catholic and she's been called the only great American Christian writer. Her name is Flannery O'Connor. And she wrote um, about her faith in this quote. She said, my faith is not what I write about or what I paint about. It's the light by which I see. And I think that that is true also for our guest today, whose name is Halim Flowers. Um, he is one of our masters and mentors. And I do wanna say that Renika Cheney, our engagement manager is working things behind the scenes now. And she's gonna start putting up some images while I talk about Halim. So this is Halim. I'm gonna tell you a few things about him. He is an author. He started a publishing company called Sato, or maybe Sato, he can tell us when he comes on. It's um, an acronym for Struggle Against the Odds. And he used it to publish 11 books. And if you search for Halloween Flowers on Amazon, you'll find them all. Um, and we can move on to, to the next book images, right? So he's done all sorts of books. And then if we go on to the next image, he's also working on bespoke fashion now. Um, I think we have a couple of those pictures, Renika. Um, but the big thing that we're talking to him about today, although it's a lot of different things because he's involved in so many different things, um, is that Go ahead. And this is showing the Evening Standard. Um, and these are, at least two of these, are Halim's images that were commissioned for the um, Queen's Jubilee, her 70th, 70th, 70th year reigning. He's also a spoken word artist. And he is an activist for criminal justice reform. You can see him on his 15 minute TED talk. It's fantastic, really interesting stuff but he is also he was arrested and sent to jail to prison serving two life sentences he's kind of a slight guy. Go ahead back to the picture of him, Renika. Um, when he was 12, at 16 in DC, if you're familiar with when talking about um, oops. Well, that wasn't good. Sorry. Um, okay, now we can go on. You might have seen his story featured in the HBO uh, documentary called Thug Life in D.C. Um, the Justice Fund's Halim's Hope or Kim Kardashian's The Justice Project. 
this is the the screen from the quote before was the screen from the HBO um, documentary. So since then, we can go on to his images. And I think, I'm not sure if this is the last one or not, but he's been exhibiting everywhere. He got out in the spring of 2019. I'm going to let him tell you about that part. He's been featured at MoMA PS1 in an exhibit called Marking Time, the Age of Mass Incarceration. He's been featured at the Phillips Collection, the Krieger. He's represented by DTR Modern all over the world. He's been in London, um, Atlanta, New York, New Orleans, LA. And where we first met him at Engage Art was because in our 2020 um, contest, he sent in this image. Um, it says, One Nation Under God over the 16th Street Baptist Church. And there's a KKK member and four little girls on the other side that have scriptures above them. And with our internal team, somebody said, I don't understand this piece. Why is this piece good? You said this piece is really good. Why is it good? And so I wrote a blog about that. And I um, we've got lots of great feedback on that blog because this is an amazingly interesting conceptual piece. So that started me into a conversation with Halim, who I'd like to invite onto our screen now. Oops. You can just go to Halim, Renika. I think I'm in the show. Halim, how you doing? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Thank you for having me. So good to have you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk to our, our tribe. And I guess what I'd like you to do first is just tell us your story. Uh, my story is I was born in Washington, D.C. in 1980. Um, so that put me like right on the cuffs of the election of Reagan. And um, I say that not not in um, to like not as an opponent or a proponent of Ronald Reagan, but just like those who know if you were born in 1980 and you lived through the 80s, you had the Reaganomics, the uh, trickle down economics, the tax cuts. You had the, um, you know, the economy went down, the introduction of crack cocaine to America and all of the negative ramifications that came with that, with the war on drugs and um, mass incarceration and gun violence and, you know, um, and also beautiful things like rap music and hip hop. Um, so for me, I always, when I tell my story, I always like to say that I'm a child of Reaganomics, crack cocaine, and, and my sibling is, is, is rap and hip hop music. And, um, and, you know, my first introduction to, um, telling my reality or expressing what I was going through was through rap and hip hop, whether it was the music or the videos or the movies that was telling what was going on in my reality and, and urban, uh, what is socially constructed as black America as a child growing up in the eighties, losing one of my parents to uh, crack cocaine addiction from my home. And just, um, even though that I scored high on my SATs, my pre-SATs when I was 11, I had the opportunity to take courses at Howard University um, when I was 11. Uh, Academic prowess wasn't something that was celebrated in my community. What was celebrated was um, consumerism and, um, you know, consumerism and violence and machismo and destruction, self-destruction, drug, alcohol abuse, and selling narcotics <clears throat> to purchase these sneakers and clothes and cars that we thought that <clears throat> added value to our humanity. Um, these things were celebrated um, wrongly, now I know now, but um, me making the decision to stop selling drugs at the age of 12, stop going to school, stop smoking weed, and um, started selling drugs, my whole trajectory of my life um, landed me in prison at the age of 16 for something that I didn't do, but um, just that I was affiliated with the individuals who were accused of committing the, the, uh, the murder, um, it put me in a predicament to where as though either I had to cooperate with the government to prosecute uh, my friends, or I had to stand on my truth and go to trial and risk being convicted and getting life in prison. 
And um, I chose to stand on my truth and go to trial. And um, I didn't receive what I believe was a just outcome. But I know that God had his whole hand on the situation um, anyway. And I just remember going through trial at the age of 16, <clears throat> facing the rest of my life in prison. And my great grandmother, she would always remind me to read Psalms 23. And I, and it, and I would read it and I would read the Psalms, but it, it took me a long time to really understand what it means to you know, my Lord has prepared for me a table in the presence of my enemies. And now I look back at the table that you uh, sit down and stand before when you go on the court. Um, but even raising to the to the level where I'm at now, where I don't even see that I have enemies, um, even though people, for whatever reason, may oppose me or don't agree with me. Um, but I don't even identify individuals' enemies no more. Um, I don't think anybody is that important. Uh, either they, either they're anointed, or they're not. And if they're anointed, I, I I feel like I know what it's what it's like to be anointed. And if they're not anointed, then I know what it's not. I know definitely what it's like to be wandering in the wilderness and what it's like to live a lifestyle of harming oneself and others. So I can be empathetic to Saul and Paul um, because I've been both. So that's um, my story. And I went to prison <clears throat> at the age of sixteen and dedicated my life to just bettering myself uh, mentally, spiritually, um, definitely dedicated myself to learning the legal uh, circus to, to be able to get myself out of prison. And it took me 22 years and, and during the 22 year process, um, as you mentioned, I started my publishing company. I published 11 books threw me writing my books while I was incarcerated. I met some beautiful individuals and organizations and we were able to um, get a new law legislated to not only allow myself the opportunity to get released, um, but to allow other human beings who were uh, convicted as juveniles under the age of 18 and given life sentences, giving them the opportunity. Halim, I'm not hearing you. Audio. Renika, do you know what's going on? I can't hear your audio. Okay, Renika's telling me something here. Hold on. Okay. Halim, she's saying it's on your end. Um, I wonder if you want to try saying something now. It might make sense. Oh, well, now I can hear you. Okay. Maybe I had to get out of my car. It's okay. Oh. It's okay. I apologize. What part did oh. you lose me? Um, so you were, you had done these 11 books. That's when, that's the last thing. Okay, I yeah. Published 11 books and through the 11 books that I published, I had the opportunity to develop relationships with some, uh, phenomenal individuals and organizations. And we were able to, uh, get local DC legislators to change the law to, uh, allow human beings who were given life sentences as children under the age of 18 to give them the opportunity to uh to be resentenced and released so the law was passed in 2017 and i had the opportunity to come home in 2019 and um march 2019 so i've been home for three years now and we've had over 100 individuals to um, be released under the law and um and we're just looking to do more more work in that area um Whereas though stop charging children as adults and stop putting children, they no longer put uh, children in adult jails anymore in DC. So we were able to get that done. Excellent. Well, I mentioned before the super predator tag and uh -huh. the that comes from a, a Princeton study or something, right? And the, the other phrase that I've heard you talk about about that study was, that these folks, meaning you, were mm -hmm. godless, fatherless, and jobless. Did that yes, fit? 
Um, I definitely wasn't godless. Um, my father was absent, uh, as I mentioned, due to his drug addiction at the time. And um, I definitely was jobless because I was a child. I couldn't legally uh, get a job. But for me, my um, rebuttal to that theory now, which even the author of it is now recanted and um, repented, and, uh, from that position. Um, for me, it's like if we see that children or any human being is godless, fatherless, and jobless, let's provide them with, with God, and let's provide them with father figures, and let's provide them with jobs and entrepreneurial activities, and that, let's not just... Um, because in America, we're so innovative, so creative, um, but when it comes to what we know to be criminal justice, that's when we lose our innovation and we remain trapped in the 18th, 19th century of just locking people up. And um, so me as an artist and a, and a manufacturer of culture, I definitely want to um, use my creativity to change the whole dynamic of, in the way in which we deal with um, offenders and those who offend and not have to put um, animalistic uh, identifications on human beings and to still be able to uh, recognize a child or an adult who has done something horrible and to be able to put them in a place uh, which they can really heal. So your moral compass seems mm -hmm. to have done a 180. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Has your, has your moral compass changed and if so, how and why? I don't I always get asked that question, um, when or how did I change? I, I never changed. Um, my moral compass has always been, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I was, I was raised in the church and in the mosque. Um, I was raised by uh, ministers, you know, in the church and uh, imams in the Islamic faith. So I, I always had a strong moral compass. It's just that uh, when I was a kid, when I became a teenager, I was willing to suffocate who I really was, you know, how I was raised mm -hmm. for the celebration of my peers. So it wasn't cool to be empathetic. It wasn't cool to be compassionate. It wasn't cool to be academically smart, right? It was cool to have the, the sneakers and the leather jackets and the girls and to be able to fight and, you know, to have a reputation of being reckless. And so, um, I chose to take on this character called Face. And um, and when I chose to take on that character, um, you know, I played the part as if I wanted to win an Oscar, but who I am morally has always been sound and always been genuine and loving. Um, I just didn't have the confidence. I didn't have enough self-love to be me in spite of uh, the, the trend that my peers um, were on at that time. Yeah. And you were always involved in the arts, right? Yeah, one way or the other, whether it was like um, I, I did performance art at my elementary graduation. My grandfather still had that. I don't know if he still had the tape, but I did this dramatic play. Um, my, my, one of my grandparents would play the saxophone, so I tried to mess with the instruments. Wasn't really good at that. I was a boxer, amateur boxer from the age of 6 to 11, so that's martial arts. And... Um, and then I was a rapper. I started rapping when I was like 11 and 12, you know, so I've always been like just artistically, um, you know, guided to, to express how I feel. Well, and when I look at your work and how it sort of evolved <clears throat> through prison and writing the books and you were taking mm -hmm. your rap and making it into poetry and then you're taking your words and connecting them with images mm -hmm. and that seemed to be the bridge where you right. were taking the Wall Street Journal, right? And you were putting right. words and images on top of photos and language from the Wall Street Journal, and then mm -hmm. you're painting. Now, did, did I get that right? Is that sort of how yeah, you left that's, into that's, the individual that's, artist? That definitely was a trajectory. Um, I didn't start painting mm -hmm. until 2020, March, during the quarantine. So, um, so when I sent the painting to you, I had only been painting for like, that painting probably was like one of my first 10 paintings <laughs> that I had ever done. It's amazing. You know? And the thing about it is it's so thoughtful. 
all the mm-hmm. pieces have meaning that you have to kind of work out. It's not right in your face and obvious. Mm-hmm. Some of it is, but not all of it is. And that's why it was so interesting that it, it wasn't about craft so much. Mm-hmm. But then uh, reading about your artistic journey, you talk about Basquiat. And can you tell mm-hmm. us about finding Basquiat and what that did for you? Yeah, I'm a I'm a huge rap fan, and Jay Z is definitely my favorite rapper. Um, him and Kanye West, who's also Christian. Um, and I, what I love about Kanye, he don't mind putting God in his music, um, which I think is dope. But um, I learned about Basquiat just listening to Jay Z, and being in prison. Like I said, we don't have access to smartphones or social media or the internet. So as Jay-Z is saying his name, I'm thinking like, is he talking about a fashion designer or island somewhere? Or never would I conceive that Basquiat, Jean-Michel Basquiat would be uh, this young guy who I read the, I read an article about him in the Wall Street Journal and they just had a picture of me at the dreadlocks and just saying how he was, you know, from New York, Brooklyn, he overdosed and died on heroin and and but how how he's so celebrated, I just never thought that someone who is socially constructed as black could be so celebrated in the fine art world, which normally doesn't um it's not as inclusive for people of mm-hmm. African descent. Um and then when I had the chance to see Basquiat work, it was so it was so like it's so textual. I didn't know he was a poet at that time. Mm-hmm. So I, I can see why it resonated with me because it's textually and intellectually driven and it's not visually driven. So me seeing his work and me not knowing how to draw or paint, I was like, it really don't matter. I could just express how I feel because I have this these intellectual ideals and I've had decades to sit in the cage like the Courage and the, and the Count of Monte Cristo and to read all of these different topics that people are not even aware of, but that impacts their daily lives. And I can be able to put this on the canvas in a poetic way. Um, it's just like a, it's like a school board for me. It's like a professor, you know, at the, at the chalkboard, you know, and I'm just teaching lessons with the canvas and the paint. And you do have just so much to say on so many topics. I'm gonna do a sort of call and response on that a little bit, mm-hmm. a little bit later, cause it's, just fascinating and as I understand it it's because you had so much time to read but you had limited reading materials but a lot of time is that right definitely what? limited definitely um limited in some capacity but really not because my mother worked at the Library of Congress so anything that was ever copywritten if I couldn't buy it and get it shipped to the prison um, through Amazon um, I could get my mother just to go downstairs at her job and, 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 and Xerox copy it and mail it to me. So, you know, my mom's who I'm at the hospital with right now, um, and she get her procedure done. She is definitely the unsung hero. She, um, her being at the Library of Congress is how I was able to copyright all my books, get everything done, you know, get to where I'm at now. So just shout out to all the moms that uh, be loving unconditionally, you know, Dads, we're a little tough, you know, so, but moms be, um, you know, moms are amazing. So I definitely wouldn't be here as a human being if it wasn't for that, that unconditional love and support. You have some phrases that are associated with you, and I'd like you to share some of them with us and sort of where they came from or what they mean to you. Mm-hmm. Any of them that you want. One of them oh, is love the antidote, right? Love the antidote definitely came from the uh, the COVID crisis. Um, I felt I don't, you know, I'm not a I'm not a virus scientist or anything like that. Um, so I don't know about like you know viruses and pandemics, but I do know that um, as it is above, so it is below, and as it is within, so it is without, and what is in the darkness will come to light. And we're not encouraged in our world to be loving. And we create these social constructions to identify uh, humanity and create these hierarchies to make some people uh, of value and others not. And um, we, we treat each other 
uh, in a way other than we would treat ourselves, right? Yes. And um, and that's a virus to me. So I felt like the pandemic was um, something that was just like birthed out of our lack of love for one another. And it was something that God used to show us how 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 interconnected we are and how even though you may have billions of dollars, but how you can get put in a predicament where you need that Amazon delivery person now that you can't leave your home to bring your groceries to you. And um, so, you know, that's for me, like love is the antibody, love is the antidote. It's not, um, not, to, just not to get into the political uh, argument about should you get vaccinated or not, um, but just, you know, just, Love is the thing that's going to cure us from this global pandemic of um, being unlove unloving. Because I don't believe that hate is real. I just think hate is a vacuum of love. It's, it's a void of love. So that's where that came from. Very cool. I have a lot of slogans. So you got to tell us one more. Off to me. Yeah, I was thinking about one today. Um, you know, so I just, they just keep coming. Do you want us to tell us about another one or you want to move on? Um. Well, you can choose another one, whichever one stand out to you. I'm cool. Uh, well, how about if we go to one of your spoken word pieces that has a phrase okay. in it that is about um, the topic that Engage Art has been engaged in so much, and that's the spiritual battle. Um, okay. And I, I heard you perform a couple different times this piece that mm -hmm. includes a line that um, the spiritual battle between love and hate. All right. It's not a, it's not a spiritual, it's not a, it's, hold up, it's not a, what did I say? It's not a political war. How did I say that? Okay. How did I say that line? I don't remember what came before it, but I was like. It's not a political war, but it's a, a spiritual, spiritual battle war. between love and hate. Between right. love and hate. And so you've, right. you've got this love and hate. You're talking about the dichotomy of anybody who has lived a spiritual battle in their lives. I think you're a great example of that because mm -hmm. you've come out of this unbelievably challenging experience, a font mm -hmm. of positivity. How did that happen? And do you see your life or the constructs in, in our society as this spiritual battle? Or is that something you've moved past? Or how do you think about it? I definitely, I definitely, um, Ephesians six twelve, I believe it is. Like, I, I definitely like. I'm, I'm, I'm a mad scientist, you know. So it's like everything that's in, everything that's tangible and material comes from the immaterial reality, energy atoms, right? And so, and atoms is just like energy, positive and negative. So, um, you know, and we attract what we are more than what we want and I believe in it wholeheartedly and I believe the scripture says it what you put out is what you get back what you what you reap what you sow is this different the different theological uh institutions may express it in a different way mm -hmm. but I believe that wholeheartedly and I don't I don't ascribe to the material I know that it's the immaterial and uh, the material is the surface thing that people get lost in but the immaterial, that part that where the scriptures, you know, mention about, you know, you must be like this child to enter the kingdom to heaven. It's not talking about a physical child. It's talking about the spirit of a child, you know, the energy of a child, the innocence of a child. And I still ascribe to that. I, I don't, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. Um, I don't get into like the race politics and things of that nature. Even though I have my own uh, traditional faith practice. I don't get into debating it. Um, I just think that it goes back to the golden rule. Um, you know, love God and love thy neighbor as I love thyself. So if I love myself and I know that anger and hatred and bitterness is going to cause, will cause me ulcers and stress and bust my arteries and high blood pressure and knowing that the body is the temple of God, I'm going to honor my temple by not uh, making these negative emotions a part of my um, spiritual diet and out of love for myself and out of appreciation to God for making my body a temple. I'm going to stay like in positive, joyful, empathetic, compassionate. 
um, attitude and perspective. And, and, and even if I want to advocate or be an activist um, against something, uh, people, places, and things that I believe are harmful, I'm not going to do it from a place of anger and hatred. I'm going to do my advocacy and my activism from a space of love and compassion and empathy because I've been both, right? I've been both. I've been Saul and I've been Paul. So I know both sides of the fence. Amen. Well, one of our um, community members, one of our tribe members had a question that was sort of like that, which was, how did you survive incarceration Mm -hmm. knowing that you were wrongfully imprisoned and did forgiveness come easily for you? I mean, initially as a child, um, like it says in the scripture, you know, when you're a baby, you got to have milk. And then when you when you're an adult, you get ready for hard food. Mm-hmm. And going to the prison and facing that as a as a teenager, um, I wasn't ready for the hard food, mm-hmm. th- that type of spiritual understanding. Um, but as you know, as I evolved and had great mentors and great teachers, um, I've watched like Kung Fu movies that taught me about love and forgiveness. A movie called Hero with Jet Li. I've heard songs. Um, like Sam Cook, the change is gonna come. I've read scriptures. I've, you know, so many different people, places, and things that were giving me the nourishment towards love, right? Mm-hmm. And how love is the most powerfulest weapon. Um, and as it says, I think it's in First Corinthians. I can't remember the chapter, but just talks about love. Love is this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is. So all these different things I was reading about love and and seeing and hearing about love, and it just like felt good to me. And I just, it made me feel good. And and that's how I survived. Like if you have love for self and the courage to love others unconditionally, right? Irregardless of all of these cultures and traditions and theories that encourage you to anything other than else, Mm -hmm. um, you could survive whatever, you know, God will give you the strength. And he'll make it easy for you. And I used to pray. I used to pray and ask that my my, uh, difficult matters become easy for me. Wow. That's impressive. (laughs) Um, One other thing, you you talk about how you want to make it cool to be smart. And I'll tell you, when Mm -hmm. I'm listening to all these interviews with you, you're very smart. And it's really interesting. I've lost your your video. There you go. go. Um, Yeah. How in your communities and with the people that you're working with, are you trying to make it cool to be smart? I just think like, um, I look at when I was a kid, what was it? I was very impressionable to like fashion and sneaker culture. Um, because like so much of our coolness, our value was attached to what you wear, and what you wore. Mm-hmm. So me being a fashion designer, um, I use that uh, as a weapon to do my messaging to the youth. Um, And I just like, I live a cool lifestyle too. Like I use social media, you know, and I like, I show, because I know a lot of people won't have physical access to me, but they can tap into my my hieroglyphics. You know, I look at social media as like the hieroglyphics to my pyramids. And Mm -hmm. these are like the iconography and the text that I'm using to leave behind my legacy. So I want the kids to see like, you know, you don't have to be a dope dealer. It's cool to read books. Um, you don't have to be senselessly violent uh, to be validated. You can be smart, you can read art. That's why sometimes I put on my space helmet. I put on my Star Wars helmet. Mm-hmm. I talk about time traveling. I collect comic books. I play video games. Like you can do all these different things and still be cool. You know what I'm saying? And being cool is now all the time just like having to respond to uh, everything with violence. It's other emotions that you can choose. And the youth, they, they, they tap in, they learn from social media and they, I want them to see me as a husband. I want them to see me as a father. I want them to see that's cool too. It's cool to get married. It's cool to be committed. It's not nothing to be afraid of. It, will it be easy all the time? But well, some people will, some people won't. But it, it's, it's nothing wrong with like being that person that you wanted your mom to have you know a lot of boys see what their mothers go through and they're like damn man i wish my mom didn't have to go through that with these guys and then they'll turn around and do the same thing to somebody else 
So I just want them to see that it's cool to be loving, you know, to paint about it, to rap about it, to put it on clothes and sneakers, and to see that, like, it's commercially good and it's socially good, and that yeah. you can make a career out of being loving. Very nice. Well, and some of the things that you use your art to talk about are um, interesting topics that you have extensively researched, like um, economics. So I'm just going to name some topics and mm -hmm. you just give us your little blurb on them. OK, pass along your wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. Economics. Let's start there. Economics for me, um, when I was in prison, I realized that the only reason I started selling drugs is because I didn't know anything about money. And, um, and I realized like, damn, I know I have to make money and I know I want to make a lot of money you know, to take care of my responsibilities and to be able to help people. So I need to learn about money. And it's not just like about uh, how to make money, but like what money is and what to do with it when you get it and how was it created, you know? And, um, for me, I had that incentive, uh, of coming up poor and suffering from the consequences of poverty. Because I really believe had I been rich, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have went to prison. Um, I could afford better lawyers. I had a good lawyer, I could afford a team of lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I just like, just, just like, I started reading the money section in the local newspaper and then I, I, I had a mentor who, you know, introduced me to the Wall Street Journal and another mentor introduced me to like, um, papers that the Federal Reserve release every quarter and, and old economic books like The Wealth of the Nations and Karl Marx with communism. And so I just just was reading and tapping into everything that my mentors were guiding me to. So that's another thing, like mentors, shout out to the mentors. Like your your everybody has value and to be able to reach back and to, and to give that value to other people who appreciate it and seek it. it it's a beautiful thing. So for me, like economics was, was, I looked at it was like, it was, it was a necessity because I had faith that I would come home from prison. And if I did, I knew what type of lifestyle I wanted to live. And I no longer wanted to be subject to the, uh, to ignorance about, you know, wealth. Yeah. How about um, entrepreneurship? I think that's a topic mm -hmm. of great interest to artists. Right. Um, for me, I, I knew I, I don't, I recognize I didn't have the temperament to be an employee. Um, I don't like uh, being on other people's time. To me, that's like a prison. Um, and I and I knew that I had the work ethic and the integrity. Um, I had the work ethic to, to put the work in on my own. And to, because if, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you, you have to work more, mm -hmm. right? And I knew I had the work ethic and the tedious nature that for record keeping and stuff like that. But I also had the integrity that when I meet people, as you see from my life, I went to trial. I could have just cooperated and went home. I didn't have to like stand on what I believe was the right thing to do and get life in prison. So when I do business with people, whether it's art collectors or corporations that I collaborate with, what I say is what I do. And if and I show up before time, I'm willing to stay after time and, um, and, 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 and I'm, go I'm just going to produce, you know, and honor my word and, and, and make working with me as easy as possible. Um, so that part for entrepreneurship is important because some of us recognize that we go from job to job to job because we just don't, we're not built to be employees. And some of us just want to make a career out of doing what we love to do. And that's art. Right. Yeah. And knowing the business side of art just doing the painting is not good enough you gotta you know it's reaching out to the engaged arts and the fellowships and the residencies and the art galleries and the museums and the collectors and the curators and it's a lot of work but the social media is there that connect you to everyone and um and you can keep your phone on you no matter where you go and um so like knowing that business side to how to really run a profitable artist studio and to be able to make a living from that is, is very important. Yeah, and I, I heard you say once that the hustle that you learned mm -hmm. when you were um, young has paid mm -hmm. off for you as an artist. Yeah, for me, like Washington DC was the murder capital 
of, of America at that time, the highest murder rate per capita. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're willing to, as a 12 year old kid with no gun, uh, and I had to wait until the graveyard shift because no adults would buy drugs from me. I was 12, I looked like I was six. So to be able to stay up from midnight to six in the morning, seven in the morning, still go to school after that, um, and you in the in the graveyard shift at night with no gun in the murder capital of America, um, just to hustle. Even though looking back on it, of course, it, it was morally wrong and it was illegal. But the ethic and the and the courage that it takes to make a dollar, that's what I learned from that. So even like when I started painting, I started painting, I wasn't like technically trained. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, okay, I'm going to send this paint to engage artists. This paint is dealing with Christianity, you know, like it has a meaning behind it. And I'm sending stuff here, I'm sending stuff there, 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 there. And I'm just grinding. And people was laughing at me at first. But two years later, now don't nobody like laugh. And now with me starting out with the fashion, some people in the art world are like, well, you should just stick to fashion. I mean, the art, you know, you make a lot of money. I'm like, all right, you laugh now. But when you turn around and you see I have a, a fashion house at a billion dollar evaluation, you know, you won't be laughing because I know the hustle and I'm willing to do the work on myself first. I have to do work on myself to learn the industry mm -hmm. and to do the networking within the industry and to do great work, to make great clothes that people like wearing. So that is the hustle. The hustle is working on yourself, telling yourself like I'm, a, I'm going to use social media for business first and not to laugh and play right yeah and i'm going to stay up late and i'm going to get up early even if i have to do this what i love to do in conjunction with a job i don't love to do until what i love to do can compensate you know where i don't have to work the job that i don't like to do yeah so, so can you tell us um i've got a question coming in about what is what is your art process like so you've been talking about how hard it is, and mm -hmm. believe me, we all know that, um, but that the hustle and the work ethic mm -hmm. can make it pay off. So what is your process? Can you share that with us? The process of the art or the process of the hustle? Well, I think they're asking about the process of the art. I'm also interested in okay. the process of the hustle because I think artists can really learn from that. For me, the process, like I have a group show that I'm participating in in L.A. next month. And I'm like preparing for my fashion show. Got a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I knew I had to do the piece yesterday, right? So a few days before yesterday, I'm kind of throwing it around in my mind. Okay, it's an L.A. space. It's a group show. What am I going to come up with for L.A.? Because I had a chance to go to see art shows in L.A. So I'm like, what am I going to bring to L.A. that's going to pop in? You know, so as I got to the canvas last time, I'm just painting Right, and I'm just waiting to see what I feel. But then it came to me like, you know what? One of Basquiat's famous paintings was uh, Hollywood Africans, right? And it's one of the one of one of my favorite Basquiat paintings that he's ever done. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna do Africans at the Broad, right? At the Broad Museum, right? And that's when I, and once I had that, I just started painting. And I didn't know what exactly what I was gonna do, but I said I'm gonna paint what I feel. But I know. The concept is Africans at the Bro Museum. And then it came to me as I'm doing that, I'm like, oh, I'm going to start a whole series. Africans at the Guggenheim, Africans at the Louvre, Africans at Tate Modern. So this is how things evolve with me. It's like it'll begin like with a process of meditation and praying and thinking before I get to the canvas. And then once I get to the canvas, I just listen. And once it comes to me, oh, this is a whole series. And this could be on sneakers, and this could be on coats, and this could be on, oh, okay, you know, so that's, that's, and then the, the, the process of the hustle is like, I just don't waste time. You know, time is the greatest resource. I know how I want to provide for myself, my loved ones. I know, like, when I'm in Seattle or uh, uh, San Francisco or L.A. and I see the, the homelessness, that's the that's the process of my hustle right there. It's like, you know what? I'm going to out-hustle Bill Gates as a philanthropist. I'm going to become a billionaire, and I'm going to show the billionaires how to really be philanthropists, whereas though, like, 
it's no way that we should have homeless people just living like this in America when we have all these billionaires. But they don't know how to hustle their philanthropy. It's not that they don't have good intent. They can put money at things, but I don't think that they've really seen a billionaire that's going to really hustle to fix America. You know, not politically or, you know, morally, but just like, I see homelessness. I see people going to prison because of poverty. Like, and I'm going to put my hustle that I put into building my empire. Now I'm going to put in this into building humanity. So mm-hmm. like, for me, when I see stuff like that going, that adds to my process and my hustle because it's like, I don't know this homeless person, but like, I'm so motivated to build out this multi-billion dollar empire, this trillion dollar empire to help people, you know, and like, I want to make beautiful, what we call prisons and jails today, I mm-hmm. want to create, I'm going to create a culture to where as though they look like this. Mm-hmm. Like campuses, you know, beautiful. When you go inside of them, of shelters, like you see art, beautiful art. It smells good. You know, it smells good. It's like all the aesthetics. Like why do poor people or why do criminals have to be robbed of beauty? Mm-hmm. And you wonder why they come out mean-spirited and bitter because you're denying them the aesthetics of life. You know, so... That's that's just like my process and my hustle. Like I don't waste time, and I'm constantly using this phone for what I feel like it's supposed to be used for: learning, connecting with people, places, and things. That's my tribe, and my tribe is my vibe, regardless of your race or your religion or your class or your gender or your sexuality. Like, if you vibe how I vibe, you with unconditional love, and you with using your talents and, and and your time to help humanity. That's that's my tribe. You know, and that's how I vibe, and, and that's how we hustle. We just hustle like that. We come together on love. We have dope conversations, and we put together dope ideas, and we create dope events, and then we use the money to create dope systems and institutions. And that's just the process of my hustle. And dope that, just means good. It don't mean drugs. Like so Okay. It's great, I knew that already, believe it or yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how about parenting? Turn to one Work second that you say that. Give me one second to lose my camera. Just for, I just want to make sure my mother's not texting me. Oh yeah, yeah. Put it on, don't disturb. Okay. My mother said they're ready. They need me to call, but I'm just gonna go in. Um, okay. Instead of calling, continue to enter. Parenting is definitely one of the most uh, difficult things that I've ever have done. Um, my daughter is very. Uh, challenging, very energetic, um, and for, for me, we are to have, okay. You I'm sorry, we lost you for a minute, but I hope we're you're back. Okay. Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I had to take my mother to this hospital. And they want me to call. I'm gonna see if I can get her out without calling. I apologize. Um, That's okay. But your mom's okay, yes? Yeah, I think so. I'm just coming to see her now. Um, but I apologize. I had my time off, and I may have to. Really excited. I may have to. I apologize. I may have to call. Yeah. Do you want to get off here and call and then you can call back in well, and I yeah, can do some I, things in the meantime? Yeah, just give me like three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you in a minute, Halim. All right. Okay. So let me just see what questions we have here and if there are any of them that I can answer. Um, let's see. We did that one. And um, Naneka, you're asking if he's Christian or Muslim. He was born, he was uh, raised in both traditions, and I don't think he is an active part of either at this point. But that if he were, it would be Muslim. 
I think that's true. Um, and Renika, could we put up um, the contact information that we were going to do at the very end while we're waiting for Halim to come back? So where you can find it, more information about Halim and connect with all of his social and all those things is at halim-flowers.com. Um, so you can go there and, and that is your jumping off point to find out everything about Halim. Um, if you want to know more about Engage Art, um, our website is engageart.org. You can sign up there at the very bottom of any page for our newsletter and stay in the loop. We've had a contest. Um, we've just come to the end of our 2022 contest and we plan to announce the finalists. I believe at the end of this week is when they will come out. Um, so we are at the end of our contest cycle and we're going to be doing some different things besides a contest for the next year to 18 months. So we're going to start talking about those in earnest as soon as our winners um, have been announced. So probably in September. Um, but in the meantime, we've got you can follow us on social. You can find out what we're about at our website. And Renika Cheney, who is taking care of all my back end stuff today, does this amazing Bible cluster monthly on the last Tuesday of the month at, at 9 p.m. Eastern time. The next one is July 26th. And it's a, a come y'all event. So anybody who wants to come can come. And what happens is you read a scripture and Renika is so cool. She has it so that it's read in a couple different languages, which is really interesting because there they end up being people from all over the world. So you read it, you look at some art that it, it was inspired by it, and you talk about all that and um, all different types of, of um, perspectives are welcome. And then you pray and that's it. That's the whole thing. It takes about an hour, hour and 15 typically, but that's because people get so into the conversation. Um, so those are some of the things you can do with Engage Art. And I wanted, I want to say while we're waiting for Halim to come back for just a, a couple more minutes um, that I want to thank Renika, who is doing an amazing job behind the scenes today. And um, also, of course, Halim, I'm sure I'll do that again. But really, all of you guys, all of our tribe and folks who are coming to take a look at, at what we're doing and are interested in what Halim is doing. Um, he's got so many things that overlap with Engage Art. I think it's really interesting. And for those of you who feel like uh, you look at his artwork and you go, what? I don't get it. I want to um, do another quote, another of the quotes from our website, which is by a guy named T.M. Moore. And he was a theologian and a poet. Um, and he said, if the main contribution that Christians make to culture is complaining about it, then we're doing something wrong. So if the only contribution that Christians make to culture is to complain about it, then we're doing something wrong. And I think that's important for us to remember. Um, and that for anybody, if all they're doing is complaining about culture, then they're doing something wrong, right? Um, and looking at one of the things Engage Art's really interested in is giving artists who are concerned about what it will do to their career or their reputation, or just have never thought about it or think it's silly or dumb or something, to look at scripture as an inspiration for their art. If you look at the history of art, if you go into any of the great museums, what you'll see is that scripture has been the inspiration for art as long as there has been scripture. And that's interesting. Where do you fall into that kind of, of pattern um, of interest? So what themes and ideas might you be able to incorporate into what is interesting about your work to you. 
interestingly, on the opposite end, for folks who are looking about, or who are familiar with scripture and it's part of their life already, um, that may not have been basing any of their art on it, but are artists, that seems to be an obvious place to for personal development. And then for folks who have scripture as part a regular part of their life, but they aren't artists, one of the really important things to understand is that the way to get one of the ways to get the most out of scripture and to be able to integrate it into your life the best way is to read the scripture, to reflect on it, and then to respond in some way. Here's the thing. The arts are one of the easiest ways to respond. So if you have really integrated a scripture, you can then write a poem about it, even if you've never written a poem before. You can make a drawing of the feeling you get. You can just use color and shape and what is the feeling you get from that? How does it leave you? What is your experience of it? That is a response. If you read and reflect, you can come back with that response through the arts. So really it's it's full circle. Wherever you are in the art faith space, scripture and the arts become a way for you to better do what you do. That's one of the sort of bedrock concepts of Engage Art. Now, while we're waiting for Halim and I understand. Oh, he's here, he's back. Hi, Halim. Hey, how you doing? Good. How's mom doing? She's good. She's good. I'm just going to, we're going to go get some tea. I told her I'd give you uh, five minutes to close out. I didn't get to properly close. So That sounds great. So I've just been talking about um, scripture and the arts. And so mm -hmm. let me ask you, what your, what is your relationship to the Christian scriptures? My relationship to Christianity is definitely um, my grandmother who uh, passed away like 22 years ago. Um, she was like a, a, a stone, a pillar in, in her church community. Mm -hmm. um, and just like my, so many people in my family, uh, Southern Baptists, on both sides of my family. Um, and my great grandfather on my father's side was a reverend, a preacher. Um, so just like coming from this family, coming from the South, um, having a Christian background is definitely strong in my upbringing. Um, I went to Sunday school. I was a member of the, the, the choir at my grandmother's church. And um, and like I said, when I was going through my criminal trial, um, my grandmother would just have me to to read that the Psalms 23. And I would just like read. When they put me in solitary confinement, um, all they would, only thing that you was allowed to have in, in, inside of the hole that they called it was the Bible. You couldn't get any pictures. You couldn't get any magazines, any newspapers. So um, it just gave me a chance to like really um, to see how David felt when he was in the cave, you know, um, going through that, as I said, as a teenager. And as I was going to trial fighting for my life, uh, it gave me a deeper appreciation for, for the scriptures that I was, I was raised upon. Question from our tribe asking, have you been able to measure to some extent the impact you have had on young men, especially? Hopefully everybody can hear me. I think so. Can't see you now though. Were you able to hear me? I can hear you and see you now. Okay, so the, did you hear my response to the scriptures? I heard your response to the scriptures, yes. Okay. Okay, Did you okay, okay, cool. hear my question from the tribe about have you been able yeah. to measure the impact that you've had on young mm -hmm. men, especially? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, the metrics for me is like how uh, the young people that I know, how they how they engage with me, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like I'm not I'm so absorbed in, in my work that I don't get a chance to like my other brothers. Um, who do like on the ground grassroots community work and they're like with these young people every day seeing their growth 
Um, mm-hmm. But I can just tell, like, the other dad was with my brother. He was celebrating his fourth year release. He was the first person that was released under the juvenile uh, life resentencing law. And he was celebrating his fourth year home. And and we were in the community where he works at. And then one of the young guys just walked up to me like, Harleen. And I was like, I remember my mom, I don't know who he is, but he's like, like, man, I follow you on Instagram, man. I love everything you're doing, man. Your fashion, your art, man. Like, I just love everything you're doing. And it's just like, when you when you get that type of response from young people um, who just follow you on social media and just, you know, tell you that, like, man, I just love everything you're doing. You know, like, man, like, I... I don't do my live talks anymore. So um, that's something that I want to give out to doing, like doing my um, live recordings, like my IG live and mm-hmm. doing my uh, talks at least once a week. So. Well, we'll be looking for that. Just one more question. And that is, mm-hmm. where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself going? Where do you see yourself in 15 or 20 years? Um, Definitely is this, uh, a philanthropist, um, which I am now, but just like having more, more, more love, like more love to give. I haven't had gave so much. Like twenty years from now, I'll be sixty-two. My mm-hmm. daughter be twenty-two. That'd be a blessing. My mom's would be eighty-two. Uh, my grandfather would be one hundred and twelve. Um, and um, so you know, it's just like if if I just want to give love and like. And I just, I'm, I'm fighting a war inside, it's spiritual. And I take the war serious. You know, it's, it's a war second for second to make a loving decision um, in, in a world that's just predominantly other than love. So yeah. I'm just fighting this, this spiritual war inside of myself. And I know that if I can win the war within, then anything that I do in the arts, anything that I do in poetry, anything that I do in interviews and sneakers and clothes and, um, anything that I do, it, it's it's only going to resonate that was what is genuinely within me, mm-hmm. not a personality, right? Mm-hmm. But character. Yeah. And it's a difference between personality and character. In twenty years from now, if nothing else, even if I was penniless, I just want to be rich in character and mm-hmm. solid in character. Wonderful. Well, Halim, thank you so much, especially when you're taking care of your mom today, spending time with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and we've put up your website and folks understand how they can can follow you. I'm sure that a bunch of these folks will. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll look forward to following your career. And I do want to let everyone know that we have um, a, a Masters and Mentors video with Halim on our website, if you want to take a look at that. So thanks, Halim. Really, really, thanks a lot. Thank you for sharing me with your tribe. Have a blessed day.